Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it will whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to be starting a series of videos on how flavors are produced. This specific video will be on how fusel oils are produced and how to control them to the best of our knowledge. Before I get into the rest of the video I'd like to thank my patrons especially Chris Turner and Linton. You all helped me out immensely and I can't thank you enough. So let's get started. Okay, so what are fusel oils? Well, simply put, they're called higher alcohols by their common name. So what does higher alcohols mean? Essentially it means in the distilling world, in the brewing world, in the winemaking world. Uh, I'm not sure if it overlaps with food science or not, but in those three industries, it's essentially any alcohol that has more than two carbons. So any alcohol that's larger than ethanol. So ethanol is CH3CH2OH, so it just has two carbons. You go up by one carbon to propanol, CH3CH2CH2OH, so three carbons in a chain, and now all of a sudden it's a higher alcohol. Fusel production is essentially the result of catabolism of specific amino acids. So what is catabolism? Catabolism is just a deconstructive process. So you're breaking things down. In this case, you're breaking down an amino acid. That's as opposed to anabolism, which is the construction of things. So you may have heard of anabolic steroids. That's what they're talking about. The steroids help you create muscle. Essentially, amino acids get broken down. They get broken down in a specific way called the Ehrlich pathway, which is a metabolic process. So we can jump into what the Ehrlich pathway is so we can better understand how these fusels are being produced. And it's a very simple pathway. It's only three steps, but the diagram will uh, be more explanatory. So we can see that now. Okay, so here is the Ehrlich pathway. You got our three steps. Um, in organic chemistry, when you see the letter R, that means anything else can be attached there. Whatever else is attached there will go on to help name this molecule. So we have our amino acid, whichever one it is. It gets transaminated or deaminated into an alpha keto acid. The next step is what's called decarboxylation, where this carboxylic group will be broken off and we end up with our first fusel, which is called a fusel aldehyde. And then the next step, the third step, it can go one of two ways based on whether or not there is oxygen present. So if there is oxygen present, a specific enzyme will take this aldehyde and it won't do a reduction. It'll instead do an oxidation reaction and you get a fusel acid instead. I'm going to talk more about fusel acids in a subsequent video, not in this video. If there's no oxygen present, what happens is enzymes will come up to this fusel aldehyde and instead do a reduction reaction and you end up with our fusel alcohol. Now there are about uh, nine amino acids which can follow the Ehrlich pathway. I'm only going to be talking about seven of them in this video. I'm going to talk about the other two in their own video. But yeah, there's seven of them that become transformed into a fusel alcohol. So I'm going to show the list. I'm going to put it up on the screen as a graphic because it'd be a pain in the ass to write out here. Okay, so here's the list. As we can see on the left, we have the amino acid followed by the alpha keto acid, then the aldehyde, then the higher alcohol. So the first amino acid is threonine. It gets turned into alpha ketobutyrate, which then gets turned into alpha ketovalerate or alpha amino butyrate. They get turned into butyraldehyde and propionaldehyde, respectively and then into one butanol and one propanol. Now these two compounds just have a sort of alcoholic flavor to them. They're really not all that complex. The next one is isoleucine. It gets turned into alpha keto 3 methylvalerate, then methylvaleraldehyde, then 2-methylbutanol. And this was described as having an ethereal flavor and odor. I don't know what that means. To me, ethereal means sort of um, wispy, not very pronounced or something. Maybe there's some other meaning, I just don't know. Um, the next enzyme is valine, gets turned into alpha keto isovalerate, then isovaleraldehyde, then isobutanol. Again, it is said to be ethereal, but it also is said to be whiny. Then we have leucine, which gets turned into alpha keto isocaproate, then isoamyl aldehyde, and then isoamyl alcohol. So isoamyl alcohol is probably one of the more well-known fusel alcohols or fusel oils. It has a fruity or banana flavor. If you've ever had juicy fruit gum, you've had isoamyl alcohol. That is the flavor that gives juicy fruit its characteristic flavor. The next one is phenylalanine. gets turned into phenylpyruvate, then 2-phenylacetaldehyde, and then 2-phenylethanol. 
And this is also kind of a popular flavor and odor too. It has a sort of a rose floral flavor and odor to it. So if you've ever tasted anything and you've tasted rose or a rose-like flower, then this is the compound that's making that flavor. Um, then we have tryptophan, which gets turned into indole 3 pyruvate, then 3 indole acetaldehyde, aldehyde, and then tryptophol. I couldn't find a flavor for it because it's not something that's supposed to be consumed. The quantities that make it dangerous are very high. It's like 150 milligrams per kilogram, and 150 milligrams is probably going to be magnitudes higher than any amount produced in the first place, so it's not something to worry about. And then tyrosine gets turned into 4-hydroxyphenyl pyruvate, then into hydroxyphenyl acetaldehyde, and then tyrosol, which is supposed to have just a general sweet floral flavor and odor. So you can see that some of the pretty pronounced or well-known flavors that you find in spirits come out of this Ehrlich pathway. But we want to know how do you control these things, right? We know that the metabolic pathway is creating these compounds. We know which amino acids turn into which compounds. We know that it only happens under anaerobic conditions when there's no oxygen. But we, what else do we need to know in order to control the production of these compounds? I'm going to break it up into two sections. One is going to be on the yeast strain or genetics, and another one's going to be on environmental conditions. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so I'm going to do genetics first, strains and genetics. The reason I'm doing this one first is because it's a little less controllable by you and it's more about marketing and it's more of a case of, you know, you buy it and you hope it happens and you hope that th that description matches what you're thinking it means. So what I mean by this is that you buy a yeast species and strain, say it's marketed to produce more fusels or to limit fusel production, um, that can be true, but the environmental conditions play an equal or larger role simply because because to get the amount of control that most people would probably expect based on marketing descriptions really can't be done unless you move into the world of GMOs. And for the people that don't know, it means genetically modified organism, but these aren't on the market yet. In the distilling world, I don't know why, because no biologicals are gonna go past the still, but we can do breeding in a lab or it happens in the wild and you can end up with yeast that produce more fusels naturally. But when it comes to limiting fusels, it's more often a case that the enzyme preferentially attaches to one specific compound over another and so certain aldehydes are produced over others but that preferential attachment only happens as long as that compound's there and once it's gone then that preference is gone and so it can continue to work on other compounds. So I'll give you some examples. Saccharomyces cudria zevi. Uh, you may or may not have heard of it. It's one of the various Saccharomyces species. So on average it produces more fusels than Saccharomyces Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is your standard ale yeast. And it does this because one of the main enzymes in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's called ARO10, it preferentially binds to the alpha keto acid phenyl pyruvate. And that ends up producing 2-phenyl ethanol, which is the rose floral flavor. Whereas Saccharomyces cudria zevi has the same enzyme, but in this yeast, it doesn't preferentially bind to phenyl pyruvate. It will equally bind to phenyl pyruvate keto iso Caproate, so keto isocaproate makes isoamyl alcohol, which is the, the fruity banana flavor. Keto isovalerate makes isobutanol, which is the ethereal winey flavor. And keto methylvalerate, which is 2-methylbutanol, and it makes the ethereal flavor. It will equally bind to whichever one of these it comes into contact first. And then when it's done with that one, whichever one it comes into contact next, it'll go to that one. Whereas this one, anytime it comes up between phenylpyruvate and something else, it'll go for the phenylpyruvate every single time. In case you're wondering, Saccharomyces cudria zevi is actually a Pinot Noir yeast, so you can get it most places that sell wine yeasts because they all usually sell a Pinot Noir. Another example I'd like to go on to is Saccharomyces pastorianus. If you've ever used a lager yeast before, most likely it was a pastorianus. Pastorianus is a hybrid of cerevisiae and another species of yeast called Yabanus. In this yeast, it also has this ARO10. It has four copies of this gene. Three of them came from the cerevisiae and then one came from the Yabanus. In the case I'm describing here, it came from a study on this, whichever strain they were using. So this is specific to that strain and it's a 
lab strain, so it's probably not something that you would find at a brewery, maybe in a brewery lab. Regardless, my point is that, so when the enzymes are made from the cerevisiae gene, they're going to have this preference for phenylpyruvic. But if it's made from the Ubanus gene, instead, it has a preference for ketoisovalerate, which is the ethereal winey flavor. So the reason I wanted to talk about the hybrid is that if you were doing a comparison of the hybrid to a non-hybrid, all else being equal, I think you'd find that the hybrid produces a more complex or varied flavor profile than a more pure species will. I mean, there's always going to be exceptions, but I think because it has these different genes which produce different enzymes, you're going to find that to be the case more often than not. So strains and genetics, they play a role and you can sort of start to tailor your wash in a certain direction, but environmental conditions that you can alter are going to promote the production or the limitations of fusel oils a lot more than the strain you're using or its genetics. That's ignoring GMO, which probably could do some amazing things once we eventually get around. To it. So I'm going to show you a table of controllable environmental conditions and generally what their outcomes are going to be. Okay, so here we go. Environmental controls. Pretty simple. You have temperature, oxygen, carbon source. So what type of carbon are we using? Uh, carbon concentration, total nitrogen concentration, ammonium, which is DAP, versus uh, amino acids, and then vitamins. So generally speaking, if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the amount of fusel oils being produced or fusel alcohols. If you decrease the temperature, you're going to decrease the amount of fusel oils. With oxygen, it's sort of inverse only because we're talking about just fusel oils or fusel alcohols. So if you increase the amount of oxygen, you're going to decrease the amount of fusel alcohol. If you decrease the amount of oxygen, you're going to increase the amount of fusel alcohol. However, if you include fusel aldehydes and fusel acids, all the fusels all together, if you increase the oxygen, you're going to increase the amount of fusels in total. Um, On to the carbon source. I couldn't really find a reason for this, and I've seen it in multiple studies. If you use maltose, you will have less fusel oils produced. If you use glucose, fructose, or sucrose, you'll have more fusels produced. This could be one of the reasons why there are more fusels in rum versus a grain alcohol. So grain is going to have a lot of maltose in it, and it's mostly going to be glucose, maltose, and maltotriose. But comparatively, there's going to be a lot less glucose, whereas rum is going to be essentially all glucose. Everything I've read about the carbon source says that yeast that consume maltose over glucose, fructose, and sucrose are generally healthier, and healthy yeast produce less fusel oil. Concentration. If you increase the concentration of carbon or sugars, then you decrease the amount of fusel alcohols being produced. But there's a caveat that's only until you start stressing out the yeast, and that goes both ways, up and down. So, you know, if you don't have enough sugar, then the yeast are going to be stressed and they're going to produce more fusel alcohols. If you have too much sugar, they're going to be stressed for osmotic reasons. And again, they're going to start producing more fusel alcohols total nitrogen concentration. As you increase it, you're going to have less fusel alcohols. Again, this sort of has a caveat, and I'll get to that in a second. The type of nitrogen you use is also important. If you supplement with ammonium ions, so DAP, you'll see a decrease in fusel alcohols, and this is because yeast can use ammonium to directly create any amino acid it needs to. It doesn't need to break down another amino acid to do it. So the Ehrlich pathway doesn't need to spring into motion and no fusel alcohols are produced. That said, if you use an amino acid as your source, like say leucine, which turns into uh, isoamyl alcohol, you're going to see an increase in it. So amino acids as your uh, nitrogen supplement, you'll see an increase respective to which amino acid you're using. I also put a caveat on this. I'm what, and this is more of um, a theory on my part, or a hypothesis, as I guess you should say. My question is, I guess, can you use glutamate as a sole amino acid? So the only one you add is glutamate, and it might be the exception because for two reasons. Number one, glutamate does not follow the Ehrlich pathway. It, it is not turned into a fusel alcohol. Number two, when you add amino acids as a nitrogen source, if you add any of the ones that follow the Ehrlich pathway, a good chunk of them get turned into glutamate and then stored in a vacuole. So um, VAC 
vacuole. So a vacuole is like a storage organ inside the yeast. Let's say you add X amount of amino acids and Y amount of those amino acids are taken into the yeast cell. 40 to 60 percent of the amino acids that the yeast brought into the cell are going to be turned into glutamate and stored in a vacuole. The other 60 to 40 percent will be used directly to make proteins with that amino acid. As more amino acids are needed, the vacuole will release glutamate and it'll get broken down and turned into the amino acid that's required. So I'm just wondering if you use glutamate as your amino acid, could you increase nitrogen, decrease fusel alcohols, while also sort of bypassing this generality about adding amino acids? Maybe, maybe not. It'll have to be something I test out. And the last thing is just going to be vitamins. If you supplement in vitamins, you're going to increase the amount of fusel alcohols. And the reason for this is, generally speaking, the better the conditions for the yeast, so when you promote active growth or you promote the production of proteins to do something, there's a very good chance that you're also promoting the production of fusel alcohol. And so keep it in the right temperature, keep it in the right pH, the adequate amount of minerals and vitamins, sufficient carbohydrates, preferably maltose over the others, the right amount of nitrogen in the right form, also added at the right time type depending, you'll be promoting growth and you will be increasing the amount of fusel. So I just said uh, adding the right amount of nitrogen in the right form at the right time. And then I said type depending. I want to get into type depending. And it's more of a guess, but the rule of thumb I've come to learn is that in the winemaking industry, in the brewing industry, when they add supplemental nitrogen, what they do is they add amino acids first, then they wait, and then they add DAP second. And they do this because yeast undergo what's called nitrogen, nitrogen, metabolite repression. Sort of like the carbon catabolite repression I talked about before, how it'll use up all the glucose first, then the fructose, then sucrose, and there's sort of like an hierarchy. Well, the same thing happens here with sources of nitrogen. And ammonium goes first. So if both ammonium and amino acids are present, so if they throw in their grapes, their fruit, their grains, and then they throw in some ammonium, the yeast are never going to use any of the amino acids that are found in those feedstocks until all the ammonium is gone. And that can be problematic problematic because the the second the second rule of thumb that they talk about is that generally speaking you shouldn't add any nitrogen after half the sugar is gone. I tried to find out why. Nobody really seemed to know why the rule existed. It could be related to ethyl carbamate production, specifically how there are uh, legal levels for ethyl carbamate and if you add too much nitrogen, the yeast can sort of uh, detect that there's too much nitrogen present. It turns it into urea and then expels it out of the cell and urea and ethanol can react to make ethyl carbamate. So that could be the reason. I'm not sure though. But essentially they want all the amino acids in the feedstock gone before they add the DAP. Now most of us are hobbyists and you know using amino acids as a source can be pricey. DAP is vastly cheaper. I only ever buy DAP. I've only used amino acids a few times. I've never really noticed a huge difference myself but this is what the science says. When they add, the times they add it really depends on who you're talking to. You know, I've seen people say they wait until 12 hours after inoculating the musk or the wart. Sometimes they wait 24 hours. Sometimes they'll go based on sugar levels. Everybody has their own opinion. The way I do it is I add half at the beginning and then half 24 hours later and everything worked great that way. How much do I add? I've said this in other videos before. It's the rule that I follow one milligram of nitrogen per gram of sugar per liter of water. And I use a little calculator called VinoLab. I'll put the link in the description for you if you want to check it out. So you put in the specific gravity as you measured it. So you do it just before you're about to pitch your yeast. Measure your specific gravity. You do your calculation. So you type in, you know, 1.075, which is roughly 10% ABV. It says that that's equal to 196 grams of uh, sugar per liter of wash. So then you would add in 196 milligrams of nitrogen. But, you know, if you're using grains, then, you know, I might even go half that amount because the grains already have stuff in. It, right? They already have amino acids and they're going to be used up eventually. Or you could even go lower than that. I'd never go lower than 50 milligrams per liter though. That's generally about as low as I go. And then up depending on how nitrogen deficient the feedstock is. So generally speaking, yeast that are healthy and growing fast produce lots of fusels. Yeast that are healthy and 
are not growing fast lead to less fusels, stressing yeast out in any way typically leads to more fusels. So that's essentially the too long didn't watch. And that's it for this video on fusel oils and the Ehrlich pathway. Make sure to check out the Patreon or PayPal donation link if you want to help out the channel. No pressure though. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to learn more and have a great week.